Welcome to This Week in Prophecy with James Jacob Prash, presented by Mori LTV. Today is January 8, 2020, from the UK. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. This is James Jacob Prash in Great Britain at the moment, which is our first This Week in Prophecy of the New Year 2020. We had one scheduled earlier, a few days ago, but we basically had to uh, delay it and, and replace it because of the current events transpiring in Iran and in Washington following the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, a man whom we've warned about in the past in this week of prophecy, numerable times, now neutralized by the Trump administration in the United States. Let's begin. I'm reading from the book of Daniel, chapter 10. This is what we read. Verse 12, then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come to respond to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief priests came to help me, for I had been left there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to give you understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days that are future. And when he had spoken to me, according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. And then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O oh my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I've retained no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then this one, with human appearance, touched me again and strengthened me. He said, O oh man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Now, as soon as he spoke to me, I received my strength and said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I'm going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writings of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. This vision pertains to many days in the future. It is for the last days, but it was revealed to Daniel during the period of the Babylonian captivity and the early Persian Empire. Things that are taking place now, they were terrifying to Daniel. The events he saw surrounding Persia and Iran had him terrified. Divine intervention by angelic agency was necessary to strengthen him to face what he was beholding. But he was assured twice, be not afraid, be not afraid. If the Lord God is saying something to faithful believers in Jesus at this particular time, both Gentile Christians and Jewish believers, the natural branches, be they in Israel, be they in the diaspora, be they in the United States or Great Britain or Australia, be they anywhere, the Lord is saying, do not be afraid. You'll know about these things ahead of time. I will be with you in them and through them. Yes, the principalities controlling Iran, Persia, are indeed powerful and indeed insidiously demonic. So powerful that it required the archangel Michael to intervene and prevail just so Daniel could understand the message after a three-week battle of prayer and fasting. 
quite a situation, but it didn't transpire in Daniel's day. It's transpiring in our day. This must be our premise. We must understand these eventualities and what's unfolding in light of Daniel. Now, it tells us two things about what's going to take place in the political and strategic realm. One of which is a conflict with the European world represented by Greece. We would speak of Greco-Roman civilization. The nations of Europe come from the Greco-Roman world. The New World, North and South America, come from Europe. We are speaking here of the West. Greek culture, civilization, Hellenization always represents the West in Scripture. Then we have the kings of the East. But there is something we've talked about before concerning Iran and some of our Bible studies. Iran's are Aryans. They are anthropological cousins to the Germans. They are Indo-Europeans. They are not Semites. They are not Arabs. They are not in the same family of nations as Jews or the Arab nations. They are something different. They are related to Europe. They are a European civilization that was transplanted into the Middle East, although anthropologically they were European. But something else happened. Their ancient religion was Zoroastrian. Zoroastrianism, the Zarathustrians, as we pointed out before, had certain things in common with Judaism, believing in one God, a day of judgment, personal moral responsibility, and so forth. And this is something that in part accounts for the Magi coming to see Jesus, the influences of Daniel and Ezekiel and possibly Esther and so forth in the Persian world and in the Median world, the world of the Medes, who were the ancestors of the modern Kurds, something in their religious belief system was compatible with Judaism, and they were influenced by the presence and theology of the Israelites who had been taken into captivity into Babylon. It was the Persians at that time who were benevolent to the Jews. It was Darius the Mede who was benevolent to the Jews. It was Cyrus, Kirush the Great, who was responsible for the liberation of the Jews and the beginning of the restoration after the captivity of the Jews back to their land, as predicted by Isaiah 44 and 45. We have to understand what's happening now in light of Daniel's prophecies and in light of past history. This is not the first time there was conflict between the West and Persia. Persia, the Iranians, the Aryans, a Germanic people essentially, took on the religion of their enemies incredibly. They largely abandoned Zoroastrianism and took on Shia Islam, Shia Islam. And like all Shias, have an ingrained hatred towards Sunnis, one seeing Ali, a relative of Muhammad, in inheriting the leadership of Islam following the Battle of Karbala, as opposed to those who see the leadership having gone through Abu Bakr, his in-laws, and his theocrats. This is the dispute, and this dispute goes back to the 8th century. Hence, the hatred you see between Saudi Arabia and Iran is something that is incredibly, incredibly found in the 8th century. But it's here today, and it comes back. The Middle East is a prisoner of its own history. Things do not change. As I've explained before, a westernized version of this might be Northern Ireland, where going back again to the same time period, the 800s, 
the Irish church held out against the Romanization of the English church. When, when Augustine of Canterbury, not Augustine of Hippo, Augustine of Canterbury was sent by the papacy in an attempt to bring the English church underneath the Roman papacy, there was a resistance in Britain, but eventually the papacy won out and there was this whole history at the conference of, of Whitby or the Council of Whitby. But Northern Ireland continued to hold out against the papacy. People don't realize that the conflicts we've had in Ireland to the present day don't just go back to 1690 and William of Orange and King James and the Battle of the Boyne. They don't just go back to the Easter Uprising and the Black and Tan. They go back to the 8th century. There were other historical factors that were involved throughout Irish history where it kept resurfacing. For instance, when Pope Adrian IV threatened to excommunicate Henry II, if he didn't invade Ireland, to put an end to resistance to the papacy by the indigenous Irish Christians who got their faith from Patrick and so on, not from Rome. This was one example. How did the Protestants and English come to invade Ireland? Well, the Pope sent them, but people don't know this. There's historical revisionism. What happened with Henry VIII? What happened with Cromwell's plantation period of colonization of Ireland? and expropriation of Catholic lands, all of these things and the whole ugly history with much injustice on both sides and much hatred, it goes back to the eighth century. It was a spiritual battle for Ireland. Well, it's been a spiritual battle for Iran that is even older than that. At one time, the Iranians were friends of Israel and somewhat tolerant of Christians, not always but somewhat. When the peacock throne fell, that dates itself back to Cyrus, that is when the Shah of Iran fell in 1979, these principalities, this Prince of Persia, the King of Persia, as he's later described, is unleashed and gets spiritual control of Iran and from that political, social, and cultural and military control. And this conflict begins. The events of 1967, many people are aware of, the recapturing of the West Bank and Jerusalem. The events of 1948, the rebirth of Israel as a nation, many people are aware of in terms of the prophetic significance. Most people are not aware of the prophetic significance of what happened in 1979 when the Shah fell from power and the mullahs came to power. A demonic spiritual presence got a hold of Iran. Now, we see the conflict with Greece. There's been other conflicts with Europe and the West. For 300 years, the Roman Empire and the Persians, later called the Parthians or Parthnia, were in conflict for 300 years. 300 years. This is incredible in itself. The wars between the Arabs and the Persians have a long history, but the war between the Persians and the West, Europe, have a longer history. We can go back to the Battle of the Marathon. We can go back to what happened at Thermopylae with, with, with Leonidas and the 300s, the 300 Spartans. All of these things were a conflict between Greece and Persia, between the European world that would come from Greece and Rome, or Greece to Rome, and then to the rest of Europe, and then from Europe to the New World, and Persia. Persia also reached to the East. The founders of Hinduism were Persian. They were Iranian. Uh, it was a religion brought to India from Persia. Hinduism is not an Indian religion in its origin, much the same as Buddhism is not the religion indigenous to Tibet or to, to Cambodia or to Burma or the countries we normally associate it with. It came from India. 
Well, so too, Christianity is not a religion of the West. It's not a religion of, of American evangelicism, or it's not a religion in its origin of Catholicism or Protestantism or Eastern Orthodoxy. It's a Jewish religion. It's a faith that came from Israel. So much like Christianity turned into, morphed into Christendom and forgot its origin, so too Buddhism did the same. They forgot that Gautama was from India. He, he did not have Chinese features or Southeast Asian features and things like this, only in his statues, just like Jesus and his pictures had the blonde hair and the blue eyes, courtesy of Hollywood, etc. It was just not the reality. Well, Persia is the same. The reality is quite different than what you see taking place. The Persians were Zoroastrians. They were friendly to the Jews. Their religion followed Zarathustra. It did not follow Shia Islam, but it became it. They took the religion of their enemy. To this day, the new year and many of the civil holidays in, in Iran by their calendar are Zarathustrian, they're Zoroastrian, they're not Islamic. Be that as it may, what you see is this. Persia extended its tentacles to the east into India, where it invented Hinduism based on racism, essentially, where the Brahma was the head and the darker your skin was, the lower you were in the caste system. It came to what is northwest India, the area of the Indus Valley closest to Iran. Similarly, it tried to extend into Europe and into the Levant. Here's where the battles took place. Much of Israel's alliances with the Romans were a strategic fear of Iran back in the time of Christ and earlier. Part of the reason the Romans, the general Pompey, was accepted by the Jews and they made a covenant with him. And typifying the Antichrist, he enters the Holy of Holies. Why did they go to the Romans? Well, partially, it was a fear of the Parthians, the Persians. It goes way, way, way back. We cannot understand what's happening now unless we understand what happened in the days of Thermopylae with Leonidas and the days of Philip of Macedonia and Alexander the Great. We cannot understand these things unless we understand the history of the Middle Ages and the history of the time of Christ. But it all goes back to the prophecies of Daniel. He sees the four beasts. He sees the four sections of the image. And he predicts in chapter 10 that in the last days, you could have this conflict involving Greece and Iran. But it says something else. The real target, the real threat of Iran is rather Israel. Soleimani was the commander of the Al-Quds Brigade. Al-Quds is the Arabic word, not the Persian word, but the Arabic and general Islamic word for Jerusalem. His ultimate target was Jerusalem. Remember, the return of Jesus depends on God's prophetic purposes in large part for Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, the nations will come against Jerusalem. When you see Jerusalem coming into play, the conflict in the Middle East is not mainly about the Golan Heights or the West Bank or Gaza. It's about the final status of Jerusalem. As we always point out, where Satan got his biggest defeat and where he will get his final defeat. The determination of the demon-inspired or demonically animated mullahs is Jerusalem. That is what is really happening in the efforts of the mullahs of Iran to move Iranian influence westward. That is why you see them in control of Hezbollah and Lebanon in league with Nasrallah, Hassan Nasrallah. It's why we see them trying to threaten Saudi Arabia and the Sunni countries. They are geographically coming towards Israel. That is Satan's ultimate plan, to use Iran 
to destroy Israel. Unless we understand prophetically the theological and historical background of what Daniel predicted, we cannot understand what's really happening now in terms of what it means prophetically. Is this Daniel 10? Well, yes, it's Daniel 10. I don't say it's all going to blow up now, but it's certainly stacking the barrels of gunpowder for the powder keg. The fuse is lit. Let's continue understanding this. What Daniel saw scared him, terrified him. The demonic powers over Iran were so terrible, so terrible that it took Michael the archangel to intervene with his power to stop this principality controlling Iran. With this background in view, let's begin to look at what's happening now. Notice, the Iranian threats were not simply against the United States. They said, we will destroy Tel Aviv and Haifa. Not Jerusalem. They don't want to destroy Jerusalem. They want to Islamize Jerusalem. They don't want to destroy it. They'll destroy Tel Aviv and Haifa, the other two main cities of Israel. There's spiritual reasons. There's demonic powers. There's principalities on back of these things. Now, Mr. Netanyahu warns in his second statement of support for Mr. Trump killing this arch terrorist that Israel will respond with devastation to, to Iran, much the same as Mr. Trump is saying. This is what is taking place. It is Daniel 10 playing out before our very eyes. Soleimani was responsible for the death of thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslims. In the last few months, probably less than three months, maybe the last two and a half months, at least 1,500 people have been killed by the mad mullahs and their henchmen of the Iranian guard who keep them in power. The Iranian guard is sort of to Iran what, what the uh, SS were to Hitler. They were part of the Waffle. They were not ordinary part of the German military. They were a separate army that was controlled directly by the Nazi party. Hitler had two armies. He had the German army, the Deutsche, Deutsch, the German army, the Deutsche army, but then he had the SS. They were the army of his political party, fully militarized. Well, Iran is the same way. Now notice, Iran is like Germany. There are Aryans. They have the same ancestry. They were Europeans who migrated to the Middle East. Let's look. Following the funeral, the Iranians responded, but it was not a very successful and well-orchestrated internment service. Approximately, approximately 50 people that are known were crushed to death in a human stampede. We've seen this kind of thing happen multiple times in Mecca at the Hajj. At one time, 1,500 Muslims were trampled to death by other Muslims, but it's happened more than once. Now, I see this as God's judgment on, on this wickedness and idolatry. However, it happened at their funeral. Not only did they bury Salmani and bury the leader of the popular mobilization force of, of Iraqis, they who supported him, who was also Shia, they now have to bury 50 people who were crushed to death mourning for him. At the same time, an airplane, commercial jetliner, carrying mostly Persian, mostly Iranian passengers, en route to the Ukraine from Tehran, crashes. 
Fatalities are total, approximately 179, including the crew. Was this plane taken down by a Iranian missile accidentally? What was the reason? The Iranians will not give the black box over to the Ukrainian government, at least not thus far. And they aren't saying, why are they so secretive about it? The plane went down at the same time, the same day. Meanwhile, the frenzy that took place at the funeral, 50 killed at the funeral, this is absurd. This is crazy. Again, this is the hand of God showing his displeasure. But remember, what's driving them is their hatred of the United States and to a degree Britain and their hatred of Israel. How do we understand this? Who does Satan hate the most? Going back to Genesis chapter three, as we always say, the children of God and the people of God. Israel and the Jews are the people of God, believers, saved Christians, regenerate believers, both Jew and Gentile, are the children of God. The return of Christ depends on God's prophetic purposes for both the faithful church and for Israel. Satan must destroy these. Hence, at the present time, the evangelical epicenter of the world, although no longer demographically, certainly ecclesiologically, remains the United States, which obtained its biblical heritage from Great Britain. That's the first hatred of radical Islam and the demons controlling it. The second, of course, is Israel. They have to kill the Christians. They have to kill the Jews. We see this in the Hamas riots in the Gaza Strip and have seen it for years. Their cry in Arabic, first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. First we're going to murder the Jews, then we're going to murder the Christians. Just like with the Roman Empire. 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, and one emperor after another. Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severitus, Diocletian, one after another began trying to destroy the true church. Enmity between you and the woman. Satan wants to destroy the children of God. Satan wants to destroy the people of God. Satan wants to destroy the true church. Satan wants to destroy Israel and the Jews. We have to understand Daniel 10 in this light. Let us continue looking at this. Kassam Salamani was immediately placed by his deputy, Ismail Ghan, who's just as bad as he is. But remember, these people are simply tactical operators. That's all. Tactical operators, not policymakers. It is the mad mullahs who had their patriarch in the late Ayatollah Khomeini who make the real decisions. The Islamic radical theocrats make policy. People like Soleimani simply carried it out, sort of like Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant. Grant was somebody who understood that you could not defeat the Confederacy quickly or easily. You had to slug it out, as it were, and he became a competent general simply because he faced reality that he was up against a Robert E. Lee, who was more clever than the Union generals, generally speaking. He was somebody who was very apt at what he did in executing the policies of the Lincoln administration. Lincoln could not find the general who was that good at it before Grant. They were all hopeless, pretty much. But with Grant, it changed. Well, Iran is the same. He was the Soleimani. He was the one who could implement the policies of the mullahs. And so it went. The Iranians did not expect President Trump to take him out. 
The Iranians looked upon President Jimmy Carter as a spineless coward, and they saw his administration as emblematic of perceived American weakness. The failed hostage rescue, uh, which was badly planned strategically, did not work. Uh, not adequate helicopters, not adequate backup plans. It was completely incompetent, uh, run by a politically appointed Air Force general, David Jones, not somebody who would have been a ground commander. Uh, it was a total mess by the time he did anything. But he waited too long to do anything. He was seen as weak and spineless. The Carter administration was seen as emblematic of American weakness. It goes on and on. Mr. Reagan showed a bit of muscle compared to the others. But then we have the realities of Mr. Obama. Mr. Obama left office with no legacy. His domestic legacy, that is Obamacare, his attempt to nationalize and federalize control of one-sixth of the economy by Obamacare, by federalizing the healthcare system, imploded due to mismanagement, poor planning, badly contrived, and political corruption. It just imploded. It is a failure. He leaves office with no legacy whatsoever as a domestic leader. His foreign policy heritage, his achievement in foreign policy, what he wanted to be remembered for, was going to be making peace with Iran. This was silly. At least Jimmy Carter could point back to Camp David. Barack Obama could point to nothing. He failed in his domestic policies. Under Barack Obama, Afro-American unemployment of the average Afro-American family declined by $900 per family on average after two terms, after eight years. It increased by $1,000 for Afro-American families in the first 11 months of the Trump administration. This infuriates the liberals, the left. They can't deny the failure of Obama or the success of Mr. Trump in doing for the blacks what the Democratic Party failed to do, even with a half-black president. So you have a complete failed legacy of Barack Obama on domestic policy and a totally failed legacy on foreign policy. He released $150 billion in frozen assets to the Iranians, as we pointed out multiple times, and another $1.7 billion secretly in cash. Him, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, they tried to bribe these people in order to get them to make some kind of an artificial peace. Again, this is the same kind of cowardice and stupidity in the eyes of our enemies that defined the Carter administration when they tried to bribe North Korea to do the same thing. They just take the money from the Americans and from the American taxpayer, laugh in your face and continue their policies as usual. Jimmy Carter was an abysmal failure. His heritage, his legacy is one of perceived American weakness. He will be a joke of history. His only saving episode was Camp David, somewhat mitigating his general failure of managing the economy, which was one of extreme inflation and his foreign policy disasters in Korea and particularly Iran, following the fall of the Shah in 1979. So it goes on. Barack Obama, the same. He's seen as weak. We remember when the American sailors were captured at gunpoint and forced to kneel down with their hands on their head, and the Iranians showed this on television. To them, it was showing Iranian dominion and power over the United States. This is what they thought. This is what they thought. This is what they thought. We could get the money. We could do what we want. 
we can continue our nuclear program covertly because they can only carry out inspections with 30 days notice, no verification. And Obama agreed to this. Completely absurd. Mr. Trump comes and says no. Well, in the meanwhile, what do we have? We saw failure by the Carter administration, then by the Clinton administration. When Iranian-backed terrorists or Iranian-controlled terrorists attacked the uh, Kaaba Towers, killing 18 American Air Force personnel in Saudi Arabia, Mr. Clinton did nothing. To the Iranians, we can do what we want. America is weak. Now we come to the era of Mr. Trump. With Mr. Trump, a drone is shot down. A second drone is hit. He doesn't respond. Nothing happens. There is an attack on Saudi Arabia wiping out 50% of the Saudi oil refining capacity. The United States does not respond in league with Saudi Arabia. Nothing. They do nothing. Mr. Trump does not act beyond the limited point strategically. But he does act. Certainly there was a degree of cyber warfare going on, but more so, there was economic warfare. Mr. Trump's strategy was to economically strangle the regime of the mullahs in order to save lives, both American and Iranian. With this, there was uprisings in Iran, protest demonstrations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mr. Trump did not want to attack Iran directly for fear that it would consolidate nationalism and patriotism against the United States, he wanted to weaken the position of the mullahs internally by economic, political, and social means. That was his strategy. Take them down economically. That is the way the United States won the Cold War. It defeated the Soviet Union economically, resulting in a political and a strategic implosion. It's better to beat them by economic means than it is to have to fight them. Why strategy? But you can only go so far. Mr. Obama drew red lines in the sand and warned Syria and Iran not to cross it. But cross it they did, and he did nothing, labeling himself in their eyes as nothing more than a coward whose words don't matter. In fact, he took money and gave it to them. He rewarded them financially. This is how stupid the foreign policy was seen to be by our enemies. And they were right. The stupidity of the Obama administration, the Carter administration, and the Clinton administration was a combination of incompetence and cowardice. But now comes the United States. Let's begin with the economic war. The sanctions work. You do business with Iran, you cannot do business with the United States. They're in trouble. Something else, fracking and oil production. This has been disastrous, not only for Iran, not only for Venezuela, not only for OPEC, but also for Mr. Putin's Russia. Mr. Putin thrived on political and military instability in the Middle East because it would artificially drive up the price and value of Russian oil and natural gas for export and bring in foreign exchange. It was his cash cow. In fact, other than weapons, it was only Russia's only major export. A bit of gold, but mainly 
oil and weapons, mainly oil. What does he do? Well, Mr. Putin, I'm afraid your cash cow is no longer producing much milk, and it isn't going to anymore. The ramifications of fracking and deregulation have made the United States the largest producer of oil, as well as the second biggest consumer, it's the largest producer. But it is becoming an exporter, and it is already the second largest exporter, if not the first, there's an argument, if it's Qatar, of natural gas and liquid gas, and plenty more to come on top of its coal reserves. What's happening is the United States has become the swing player in the global energy and oil market. What happens at the spot market in Rotterdam, what happens in OPEC, what happens in the Persian Gulf, what happens in Russia, depends on what happens in New York, Chicago, Washington, and the Permian Basin of Texas, and in the Dakotas. Other sources, tundras of Alaska, California, Gulf of Mexico. The United States is now the biggest producer. OPEC can never be or do what it once did. Saudi Arabia is in trouble. This is part of the reason Prince Mohammed bin Salman has come to power and trying desperately to revise the Saudi economy to be less oil reliant as has already taken place in Dubai. Why? To meet their budgetary demands. The Saudi Arabians need oil to be priced at above 80, some would say as much as $84 a barrel. It isn't. The biggest proven reserves. Venezuela. It's not producing hardly any oil. Its technology is rusting. The communist Maduro regime of the late Hugo Chavez had turned a relatively wealthy country into a very poor one. Again, we have the so-called AOC in America, the congresswoman from Venezuela, as I call her. Look what her ideas have done for Venezuela. Colossal failure. How can you have that much oil and per capita wealth and not be able to buy toothpaste? But that's the reality. Venezuela, the largest proven reserves, not a factor in oil prices. The Persian Gulf, 21% of oil traffic coming through the Straits of Hormuz. Japan is 90% dependent upon it. South Korea is 95% dependent upon it. Industrial economies of Asia need it. The United States doesn't. This is to say nothing of the sand shale in Canada. It just doesn't matter anymore. Now, if you had a situation like this, where the Straits of Hormuz were threatened, navigationally, as a channel for oil trade. If that had happened even 10 years ago, even five years ago, but certainly 10 years ago, if that had happened then, oil would be well over $100 a barrel for sure. But it isn't. It spiked very briefly yesterday, but crashed again today. The West Texas Intermediate price is below $60 a barrel, below 60. The Brent price of North Sea crude is about $65.55 US. This is nothing. There was a time when it was going to $150 a barrel. Mr. Putin has a big problem. He had a crisis where oil 
went so low because of gluts that it was causing him, costing him more money to pump it than it was worth on the market. His cash cow, again, is hormone deficient. No lactose, no milk coming from his cow anymore. Just a trickle, but not enough to change prices. The Trump administration is largely responsible for the increase in output of American petroleum over the last three years. People don't realize that it is probably more than doubled just since he's been president. Saudi Arabia can do nothing. Iran can do nothing. Venezuela can do nothing. Russia can do nothing. OPEC doesn't matter anymore. The United States is holding the Trump card. And the president's name is Trump. This is a big actor. Now, when countries like Russia and Iran become desperate and they no longer have their oil weapon, they have to use another weapon. Hence, they're strategically threatening their neighbors. Russia is supporting the Assad regime. Russia has technologically helped and sold technology to Iran, as has China. Now, again, this is utterly hypocritical. China is obliterating its own Islamic population in Western China, the Uyghurs. China is anti-Islamic. The regime of Ping is anti-Islamic. Yet they will get in bed with Iran. And Iran knows they're anti-Islamic. But it's about business, it's about money, and it's about demonic forces. This they don't know. Now, you have to understand something. Many Christians pray for Donald Trump. But he is surrounded, to a degree, by believers. Mike Pence, a former Roman Catholic, is a saved, born-again Christian. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, a saved, born-again Christian. Everyone knows about Mr. Giuliani, but Mr. Trump's personal lawyer, Jay Seklow, Jewish boy from Atlanta, saved, born-again Christian. He has believers around him, praying for him, praying with him, and advising him after they pray. They're seeking the Lord. He's seeking their advice. They have a certain amount of key input. God is using Mr. Trump despite his flaws. I do not agree with all of his policies. I agree with most of them. But let's understand what's happening in light of these things this week in prophecy. So the economic weapon is working. Iran gets desperate and has to rattle its saber increasingly. It sees America as weak. It tests Mr. Trump with downing the drone and certain other things. Then the embassy attack, following the attack on an American base in which an American civilian defense contractor was killed. That American civilian defense contractor who was killed, who Mr. Trump retaliated against the Iranians for killing him and against Iranian-backed forces for killing him, himself was an Arab-American Muslim with a wife and children. He was born in Iraq. He was a nationalized American, naturalized American. He was an Arab Muslim who they killed. Mr. Trump treated him as he would the death of any other American, irrespective of his ethnic Arab background and his Muslim religion. Mr. Trump said, an American has been killed, we're going to respond, and he did. But then 
Soleimani orchestrated the attack on the American embassy. In doing this, now it becomes a political equation inside the United States. One of the things, one of the main things that contributed to the electoral defeat of Hillary Clinton in 2016 was the fiasco in Benghazi. When she lied and was caught lying, when Susan Rice lied repeatedly on five TV shows, either cognizantly or as a stooge for Barack Obama, lied, and then Mr. Obama himself was caught lying to affirm the lies told by Rice and by Clinton. This was the Benghazi scandal. American diplomats killed, abandoned, a mess. The Democratic Party in the United States in an election year wanted the Baghdad embassy attack orchestrated by Soleimani to be Mr. Trump's Benghazi. Just as Benghazi was so pivotal in Hillary Clinton not getting elected, they wanted a Trump Benghazi to prevent him from getting reelected. It didn't work. This resulted in outrage. Well, meanwhile, the Iranians begin to take a risk. They never imagined he would do what he did. First, he hit back after the base attack. Then after the embassy attack, he kills Soleimani. This stunned them. It shocked them. He makes it clear he's ready to take out 52 Iranian targets, including cultural targets. Now, this doesn't mean you're targeting monuments and mosques. It means that they store weapons and ordnance in cultural pavilions. They store weapons in schools and hospitals under the advice of the Iranians in Gaza. Well, these cultural monuments that were threatened, though not by name specifically, are used to hide ordinance and rocketry and nuclear technology development in Iran. Nonetheless, he says, I'm going to take out 52 targets, one corresponding to each of the American hostages taken in 1979. Mr. Trump understood that the Iranians have long memories. They relate what's happening now to what happened then. Indeed, to what happened at the Battle of Karbala in the 8th century, for that matter. A long memory is how they see it. They were shocked that he was eliminated. They had to do something. The mad mullahs said it was only a slap to the face. There's more to come. Except that they've been ridiculed as, quote unquote, by Dick Morris and others, the gang who couldn't shoot straight. Of the 15 rockets or missiles, projectiles fired at Irbil and Ain on Al Assad Air Base, four of, four of them fell from the sky and failed to reach any target. Four of them failed. They were failed. They were not failed launches, but they failed to reach the target. They fell short of the target. The other 11 did minimal damage. They didn't kill or injure a single American, a single Allied soldier from NATO, or even a single Iraqi. It had to be deliberate as a symbolic action of retaliation because nobody can shoot that badly, deliberately. Uh, but they did shoot that badly deliberately. If they wanted to do more damage, they could have. They knew the bases they were attacking were not ones defended by counter uh, ballistic missile systems. It they were not defended by the door or by the Patriots. Those were defending bases further north in Iraq, not Yabil or Ayn al-Assad. 
a reaction by the Iraqi parliament to order the Americans to leave Iraq was not attended by the Sunni or by some of the Shia, but certainly by any of the Sunni or by the Kurdish members of the parliament. It was a minority vote. It was boycotted by many members of the parliament. It was not a full vote, and it only had symbolic meaning. Mr. Trump's response, clear. You asked us to come back because of ISIS. Barack Obama left the vacuum. The vacuum left by Barack Obama was filled by ISIS, and it was filled by Iran. You asked us to come back. We've spent billions on this base and a trillion dollars on the war after we got rid of Saddam Hussein, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're telling us to get out. Well, they have interest in the American presence to bring strategic stability to the country, but also an economic reliance. And again, their cash cow is not pumping much milk. The price of oil is not that high, and Iraq is not pumping or exporting all that much of it. They will not get help from the Saudi Arabians, who are now in a deficit themselves because of low oil prices, and they will not get the help from the United States if they ordered the United States out. It is all a big charade, and everybody knows it. Everybody. But let's continue to look. Mr. Trump makes a speech. In his speech, he says Iran appears to be standing down. They shot these missiles symbolically to placate their own people, to make it seem like they're doing something. Had they killed any Americans, we would have responded, but they didn't. We're just going to impose more sanctions economically and hurt them more financially and economically. As if they were not hurting enough. He will tighten the news economically. There may be cyber warfare conducted by the United States and Israel. But certainly, the news is being tightened even further economically. They can't take all that much more. There's already political and social instability. There's already too much domestic economic turbulence. But it continues. These European countries cannot come to their aid. These European companies cannot do business for fear of being excluded from the American market. There's nothing they can do. Mr. Trump says, we'll make a new deal, but it's time for China and Russia and Britain and France and Germany to get on board and realize the deal that was made by the Obama administration with European, Russian and Chinese support was no good. It had no guarantees. Any deal must guarantee that Mullah-driven Iran will not acquire weapons-grade plutonium to make nuclear weapons. He makes an offer. Now, the Iranians are hurting economically as a people, and they hear Mr. Trump saying nice things. We'll make you a deal. We want peace. It puts the mullahs in a very precarious situation. The only ones who have mourned the death of Soleimani, according to Nikki Haley, former UN ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the UN, have been the Democrats. A film has surfaced following the episode during the Clinton administration when Joseph Biden was a member of the Senate and the Kabar Towers were blown up, killing 18 Americans by the Iranians, Mr. Biden called for legislation allowing the president to respond to a terrorist attack without an authorization of Congress. Now that same Mr. Biden says what Mr. Trump did in taking out 
Soleimani was reckless and irresponsible. He kills over 600 Americans, 608 to be exact, leaving thousands, thousands more maimed. These are just the Americans. He attacks an American base and he attacks an American embassy. It takes place under his direction. Mr. Trump removes him. And Mr. Trump is called reckless and irresponsible. Well, how many more dead Americans do the squad want? Former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, has stated quite aptly that the only ones mourning the death, the killing of Qasem Soleimani are the Democratic Party politicians in the United States. This is hideous. The Obama administration carried out many, many hits with drones and with precision-guided missiles, killing terrorist targets in the Middle East. There was never a word of complaint. Yet the left-wing media and Democratic Party politicians are faulting Mr. Trump for his reaction in killing someone responsible for the death of 608 Americans, 17% of American fatalities in Iraq, leaving thousands, thousands more permanently maimed and disabled, blind, legless, limbs missing. Then attacked an American base. And then when America responded to the attack on the base, orchestrated an attack on the American embassy. Yet taking out such a terrorist was called political assassination. Chris Matthews, the journalist, called it a political assassination. We have Congresswoman Omar, the Congresswoman from Somalia, whom I've said many times I would like to see removed from Congress and, if legally possible, denationalized and deported back to Somalia, where she belongs. She said the United States assassinated an official of a foreign government. This was a man who killed 608 Americans. And a member of Congress is saying this? This is a wicked woman who has no right to be in Congress and no right to be in America. Nancy Pelosi, her usual hypocritical antics. What's happening here? How can you call it an assassination of a political leader, of a foreign official? He was a terrorist. He killed 608 million Americans. He's responsible for 17% of American casualties in Iraq. He attacked an American base. He is responsible for the attack on an American embassy. But it did not turn into a Benghazi. It did not turn into a political football for the Democratic Party in their election campaign to displace Mr. Trump from the White House. It's not going to be a Benghazi, as Benghazi was for Hillary Clinton. Baghdad is not for Mr. Trump. They lost out again. They're angry and frustrated. National interest, national security, the welfare of American people, the welfare of American troops, fighting men and women do not matter the Democratic Party leadership. The only thing that matters is politics and power. Joseph Biden called Mr. Trump's actions essentially dangerous and irresponsible. But a film was produced during the Clinton administration where Mr. Biden was a senior member of the Senate calling for legislation that would allow the president following the Kobar Tower attacks in Saudi Arabia to counterattack the terrorists without a green light from Congress. This is the same Mr. Biden. But now he changes the rules. 
for purely, obviously, political reasons. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. Yet so it goes. Well, it was not only Iran who lost this showdown. It's been the Democratic Party, electorally. This has them very, very angry. With all due respect to Nikki Haley, she was almost correct, but not completely. The left-wing Labour Party in Great Britain responded similarly. Jeremy Corbyn recently defeated anti-Israel leader of the Labour Party, said that Boris Johnson simply supported Mr. Trump's removal of this terrorist, Soleimani, who is also responsible for the death of British soldiers because he is trying to ingratiate himself with Mr. Trump to get a post-Brexit trade deal with the United States. Unbelievable. That deal was going to happen anyway. Mr. Trump called for it even before the second referendum national election. Desperate. Absolutely desperate. <clears throat> but it continues. Mr. Johnson has issued a statement supporting Mr. Trump and denouncing the Iranian rocket attacks on Yedbil and Ayn al-Assad. Mr. Netanyahu has issued a second statement supportive of the American position. And so it goes. Meanwhile, the impeachment joke lurks in the sway of the swamp. <laughs> Ms. Pelosi has still not presented the articles of impeachment. She's stuck with things that she knows she could never get a conviction. Having forced the impeachment through the House without due process, she is now trying to determine the way the Senate handles the impeachment. Mitch McConnell says, should be approached for Mr. Trump in the same way as approached for Mr. Clinton. She says no, with no constitutional mandate to interfere. Her name is not Schumer. It is the place of Chuck Schumer to make any arguments the Democratic Party may have, not Nancy Pelosi. But she's withholding the articles of impeachment just the same. It is all a very, very pathetic joke. Well, other things are transpiring this week in prophecy. Mr. Netanyahu has reorganized his provisional interim government and pending electoral outcomes will not be prosecuted for the matters for which he was indicted while he is in office. There is a temporary political stability taking place in Israel and a temporary stability happening in the Middle East. Now, I will leave it with this. Had this happened after the elections of next November, had the Iranians fired these rockets after the election, where it would not have been a domestic political equation. Mr. Trump would have had a free hand and the impetus to respond with bunker busters destroying Iran's nuclear development capacity. He would have had a free hand to take out the 52 targets and an electoral mandate to do so. No one would have stopped him had it taken place a year from now, but it didn't. He's being very wise and very cautious. 
the Democratic Party will not be able to accuse him of warmongering or of a disproportionate response. The Iranians obviously do not want a conflict with Mr. Trump. They know what will happen. They are humiliated. They're trying to save face, save face with their own people. And they can say this is just a slap in the face. There's more to come. Well, when there's more to come, this administration looks like it's going to be ready. And so will Israel. Let's understand these things. Yes, it's important that we understand them politically. Yes, it's important that we understand them strategically. Yes, it's important that we understand them economically, and I've done my best to explain those things. But first and foremostly, and above all, we must understand these things doctrinally, theologically, and prophetically. The visions of Daniel. As we always say at times like this, fear not, Jesus is coming soon. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.